so you mentioned how in the Hopkins research you you bought the kind of decades of, of experience of, of structuring these sessions that's something I'd, I'd love to talk to you a bit about in detail is so people get an idea of what it's like to undergo one of these these sessions because we're not talking about you know in a kind of clinical white hospital room getting a dose of a drug and being left alone right there's a lot that goes into the structuring of the experience that's right uh above all uh establishing some kind of a trust-filled therapeutic bond uh so you feel interpersonally grounded and safe going into it so there's the relationship with the therapist which i think echoes as a relationship with your own mind that you're able to trust yourself you know as well as the therapist uh, as, but there's also a simple instruction of how to navigate in these inner worlds that people need to know in advance and in my book it's like uh, I liken it to going downhill skiing, you know? Like if you just jump on a pair of skis with no instruction and start down the hill, chances are you're gonna injure yourself or someone else, you know? But no, if you're gonna go skiing, you get some instruction about how to maintain your balance and slow down and speed up and uh, uh, how to do it safely. And the same thing is true of taking a psychedelic. Uh, you need to know that if there's something that looks dark or threatening, not to try to control it or run away from it, but to dive into it, to kind of say, but I wonder what, where it comes from. What can I learn from this? Uh, uh, what does it mean? So it's always, no matter what the mind presents, it's in and through. You welcome it. Uh, you, you don't judge it. You don't say, oh my gosh, this is a quote, bad trip. Um, it's all going wrong. You say, no, it looks like I got to go through some suffering, maybe uh, unresolved grief, maybe some guilt, maybe some uh, uh, confusion about uh, who I am and where I'm going in life. Uh, but what a great opportunity. Let me dive into this and explore it. And my therapist is with me, you know? Uh, with that orientation, uh, there's nothing to fear. You know, in the ayahuasca religions, there's this wonderful image of what do you do if you see the big anaconda serpent, you know? You know, well, obviously you dive into his mouth and look out through its eyes, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but if you run from it, you, you're going to have a seminar in panic and paranoia, you know? It might be a va very valuable experience for mental health people, especially psychiatrists, to understand how paranoia gets generated, you know? Mm. But you go towards it, the paranoia never manifests, you know? Yeah, I think... And the anaconda becomes your psychic energy, your kundalini, your shakti, your chi, you know? Yeah. yeah, I think that's um really insightful as well, the way that paranoia only really comes about when you're you're not safe you, or you don't feel safe, you know, you don't have that interpersonal grounding. So you need to be looking out for yourself and you you better be overly cautious, overly, you know, on edge looking for threats. Um yeah. but yeah, so but with that grounding, that doesn't happen. Yeah. So, so that's important in preparation. And then the session itself, you know, we use a very comfortable living room type of lab, if you will. No white coats or stethoscopes. You know, we do take blood pressure. <laughs> but but um, uh, people lie down on a very comfortable white couch with some nice... Uh, often blue flannel sheets and they put on an eye mask. We even let them choose the color of their eye mask. Uh, they uh, have headphones and uh, we've developed uh, a music playlist that uh, 
gives nonverbal support. Uh, that's a very important uh, area. Uh, that needs to be, uh, music needs to be selected uh, wisely, you know. Uh, but it becomes uh, really a nonverbal support network uh, during the session. And you might not even hear it at times. You know, you're beyond the music. But if, uh, if you need support, it's immediately there. And people talk about kind of getting inside the music, almost uh, sometimes even into the mind of the composer or whatever. Uh, it's a, a very beautiful experience that might be very helpful to com actually musicians someday. Yeah? yeah. In terms of the, as you know, in my book, I talk about the medical applications, the educational applications, and the uh, religious applications of psychedelics. And, but there are significant educational applications. Uh, experiential learning this is it yeah yeah <laughs> and so the the logic of the eye mask right is is so that people will turn inwards and explore their own mind and their own psychological material rather than be distracted with the outside world yeah. right Not be distracted by the room or to feel pressure to communicate um uh, with uh your guides uh they're there if you need them you know uh, but uh, if you, <laughs> it sounds strange, but you can see so much more with your eyes closed <laughs> than you can with your eyes open, you know. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's more vivid, it's more intense. It's, and you can uh, let go of your orientation of here I am and on a particular day, you know, in a particular room at Johns Hopkins University, uh, and you can just kind of zoom out and be part of the cosmos. And it's yeah. easier if you don't have that uh, constant visual stimulation of the room. And yet there are times where you take off the eye sheet and maybe you make a trip to the bathroom, look at some photographs, eat some fruit, interact, and you might experience some very meaningful visual transformations. So, you know, that, that mode of experiencing is, can be very valuable as well. But especially with people having their first session, we try to structure it as an interior journey. And we think they, they're, the probability is that they will get more out of the day. Yeah. And when it comes to having their eyes open and looking at the room, there's this tradition of having a single red rose in, in the room. Is that something yeah. you worked with as well? Yeah, that, that, that tradition of the rose. And this is how religions get started, you know. <laughs> you know, we start having meaningful objects and, and uh, patterns of behavior, you know. I think the rose goes way back to uh, uh, early work with alcoholics in Saskatchewan. And it's just kind of become a tradition that when, and I, I think it's observed in most research centers throughout the world, that when someone has a session, there's always a red rosebud in the room. And uh, it's when you first come, take off the eye shade and come sit up on the couch, uh, it provides a very good focus, almost like an intermediary step from the inner world to getting up and hiking over to the bathroom and coming back or whatever, you know. But but it also is often an incredibly beautiful experience in itself that as a rose often uh, as you meditate on it seems to open up like in time-lapse photography where people feel they can dive down into the uh, stem of the rose uh, or something emerges within the rose and the inner world gets incorporated into the external perceptual world, sometimes in an exquisitely beautiful way. And it can lead into this experience we call external unity through sense perception. 
of a sense of the uh, ultimate energy dance of uh, everything. Yeah. Yeah.